Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy, Sabbath Happy Sabbath again. Welcome everyone here, our members, especially welcome our guests. And for everybody that's watching at home live right now on our social media platforms or that are going to be watching it later, welcome and good morning. This is the Three Angels Seventh-day Adventist morning service. Amen. Now, I've entitled this message, Sweet Samaritan Salvation. But before we start, I'd like to invite you to pray with me once again. Lord, thank you again for bringing us here safely this morning. Thank you for getting us all through everything we went through this week. Please be with the people that are not here, the ones that are hurting, that are suffering, that are healing from injuries, and that are dealing with deaths in the family. Please be with each one of them and wrap your arms around them. Be with Terry specifically as he's leaving back to Australia Tuesday. Give him safe travel and mercies. And let him remember that he has a church family here that's praying for him. And if we don't see each other again until the river of life, just bless him and protect him. Be with us now as we study your word. Forgive us for our sins and let our hearts and our minds be clear and be pure right now. Please give me your words. Touch my lips with a coal from your altar. Let me preach from behind the foot of your cross and only point people to you. Give me your spirit right now and put your spirit upon all of us so that we can understand what you have for us to learn today. Thank you for all your blessings, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, Sweet Samaritan Salvation. I'm sure you've already guessed, but this is from John chapter 4. So if you would, turn to John chapter 4 with me. The meat of our study is going to be in John chapter 4. So if you want to put your Bible marker there or a piece of paper or your finger, that's where we're going to spend most of our time today. And we're going to be looking at John chapter 4, verses 6 through 26. But before we do that, we need to get a little bit of the backstory. Just an amen when everybody's there. All right, John chapter 4, 1 through 5 is the backstory, so follow along with me. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and, and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, this is the backstory. Jesus is in the middle of his ministry, and people are coming to see him in the hundreds and thousands, more than they were coming to see John the Baptist. The Pharisees already hated John the Baptist, so they hate Jesus even more. Well, Jesus can feel this going on. He knows what's about to happen, and he can't be taken captive or killed this early into his ministry. He still has a lot more he has to do, so he knows he has to leave for a while. So he's going back to Galilee, and if you remember, Israel's in the south, Galilee is in the north, but the Samaria is in between, sandwiched in between Israel and Galilee. So he has to go up to Galilee. Well, most of the time, people went around Samaria. All right, they went the route to the east of Samaria is the Jordan River and the Jordan Valley. They avoided Samaria at all costs. Whenever the people from the northern tribes, Galilee and so other ones, would come down to Israel for the feast or for anything going on, Passover, anything else, they would avoid it like the plague. They would go all the way around Samaria just to get to Jerusalem. The reason they did this is because of the tensions were so high back then between the Jews and the Samaritans. We're going to see that a little bit more in a second. But that's what Jesus is doing here. He goes right straight through the heart of Samaria. This city, Sychar, that it's talking about here in verse 5 is in the center. It's a little bit southeast, but it's pretty much the center of Samaria. And that's where he goes straight up. He doesn't go around it. He goes straight through it, but it's for a reason. And we're going to see that. Now, verse 6 through 26, we're going to read through this together. And then we're going to walk through it verse by verse. Follow me along. Verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her and said, If you knew the gift of God... And who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you the living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. 
The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I might not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now we're going to walk through this verse by verse together. But you have to know this, the start of the story. That contention that they have between the Jews and the Samarians, Samaritans went back centuries, hundreds and hundreds of years to the 7th century B.C. Because in 721 B.C., the Assyrians came down and took the 10 northern tribes of Israel and captured them. Well, when they captured these tribes, they intermingled with each other. They mixed with the religions of the Assyrians. They got into idolatry. So the, the Jews and the southern tribes always looked at the Samaritans as not purebred Jewish Christians anymore. So there was always this contention and this strife between them. And that's what she's talking about here. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's coming to break down the barriers. He doesn't care if you're a Jew, if you're a Samaritan, if you're young, you're old, you're a woman, a man, black, white. He doesn't care. Salvation is for everyone. And that's what this story is, the first key thing we're going to see in this story. Now, the Holy Spirit is going to open her mind to this gift, and we're going to see it progress as her mind opens up and her heart opens up through the working of the Holy Spirit. Now, verse 6 is where we're going to start. It says, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weird from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, wells back then in the Middle East were very, very important because if you don't have water, your body will die within three to four days. So especially in this region, in Old Testament or New Testament times in the Bible, you had to have water because you're in the desert. So I looked up at water.org and I found some fun facts. There's 771 million people that lack safe water across the world today. Women around the world spend over 200 million hours a day collecting water. Every year, over a million people die from bad water. Every two minutes around the world, a little child dies from bad water. That means by the end of the sermon, all around the world, 20 children are going to be dead because they didn't have good water. It says that due to climate change by 2025, in just two years or less, over half of the Earth's population will not have access to good water. So wells are important. And this time, if it's important for us nowadays, how much more important were a well, was a well back then? It was central to life. Now this well, Jacob's well we're looking at, where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman, was famous. Many famous Bible people drank at this well. It's called Jacob's well, so you know Jacob obviously drank from it. And his sons, which would include Joseph. But you also had Elijah who drank from this well. King Saul, King David, and many other people drank from this well. So this is a very well-known well, for lack of a better word. And so Jesus is at this well with this woman. And you think about all the stories in the Bible where big things happened at wells. Think about Moses when he met his wife, Zipporah. It was at a well, right? Well, she was trying to feed the sheep and the local shepherds were harassing her. Moses came in, saved the day, ended up marrying her because of what happened at the well. Think about Abraham when he sent for Isaac to have a wife. He sent a servant, Eliezer. And where did he meet Rebecca? At a well, right? Then you got Jacob, who this well is named after, but Jacob met Rachel at a well. Remember, he wept, he kissed her, and he wept. So a lot of good things have happened at a well, and that's what we're going to see in the story with the Samaritan woman. But look at verse 7 and verse 8. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away to buy food. So why were they gone? Why did he not go? That's the question. Well, there's a reason. He had one person in mind. That's this woman we're going to study. And we saw in verse 6, it's about noon. It's about the sixth hour, which means sunrise at 6 a.m. Six hours from that would be noon. People didn't go to the well at noon. People went at dusk and at dawn because of the heat of the day. 
So this woman likely went because she knew no one else would be there. She was probably despised in the city. So Jesus knows when she's coming by herself that something's up with this lady. Now, the disciples, like I said, they went to get food because Jesus needed to stay behind for this one lost sheep. He never did any miracles to benefit himself. Now, he could have. He was God, and Jesus was human at the same time. He never laid off his divinity. If anyone ever tells you that, it's wrong. It says he never laid off his divinity. He clothed his divinity with humanity. He could have used that power at any time for himself, but he never once did. Every miracle, if you look in the Bible, he did for the benefit of others. He could have said easily, snapped his fingers and had a glass of water, but he didn't. He asked this woman for a reason. He asked her because he knew she wouldn't say no. He knew that the Arabs in this time, the culture, it was an honor to give water to someone. They called it the gift of God. These Arabs, if they were on a journey, they would go off their track and off their destination, their plan, their trip, to give someone water, even their worst enemy. So he knew this was a door opener. Jesus looks for any way to open the door to get to us. And he knew by asking for this cup of water from the Samaritan woman, the door would be open. He says in the Bible, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open the door to him, he will come in. That's what he's showing us right here with the Samaritan woman. Now, Revelation twenty two seventeen tells us that he wants to share this living water with anyone. It says, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let he who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wills come and drink from the water of life freely. That's what he has to offer, and that's what he's given to the Samaritan woman. She asked her own creator for a cup of water. Can you picture that? This is Jesus, her creator, and she's asking him for a cup of water. The one who made her, the one who made every drop of water in the universe. It's profound to me. Look in verse 9. Verse 9 says, Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now, Josephus, the Jewish historian, told us in his writings that this tension was so bad, the reason why they would avoid going through Samaria is there would be mobs of people, of Samaritans, that would lynch any Jewish person that came through Samaria. They would beat them, torture them, kill them. And she knows this. She knows about these tensions. They would avoid it like the plague. And it doesn't matter what they would have done. Jesus still risked his life and the disciples' life for this one woman. And if you look at all his other stories, he uses Samaritans for a reason, to show that he breaks down barriers. Think about the good Samaritan. The priest and the Levite walked by the guy that was injured and dying, right? Who helped him? The good Samaritan. Even in that story, he's trying to break down barriers. The 10 lepers that were healed and the one that came back and worshiped at his feet, they were Samaritans. When the Pharisees got mad at him, this is how bad the tensions were. The Pharisees said that Jesus was controlled by the devil or an evil spirit and that he was a Samaritan. That's how bad this tension was in verse 9. So she's shocked. Look in verse 10. So Jesus answered, this is his response, and he said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. So what is he talking about here, the gift of God? Turn to Romans 5 with me. We need to figure out two things. The beginning of this verse in verse 10, we need to figure out what the gift of God is, and we also need to figure out what the living water is. Just give me an amen when you're there in Romans 5, verse 15. The free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, talking about Adam, much more by the grace of God, the gift, by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. So we see clearly that gift of God is salvation through Jesus. We know that without a doubt. Now look at the bottom. Flip back to John 4, verse 10. Look at the bottom, his last words. He talks about giving her what? The living water. So we need to figure out what the living water is. Turn to Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44, 3. Just an amen when you're there. Isaiah 44, 3. God tells us, I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and ble my blessing on your offspring. So he says he will pour his spirit Flip back to John. This time go to John 7. I want this in the mouth of two witnesses. So we're going to look at what John says. That's what Isaiah the prophet said. Now what does John say in John 7? This is talking about the living water. John 7, 37 through 39. Everybody with me? On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, 
If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke concerning what? The Spirit. So it's clear. The gift of God is salvation, and the living water is what? The Spirit. This is what he has to offer the Samaritan woman. He's only starting the process with her. The Holy Spirit is just starting to pull on her heartstrings. He's wetting her appetite for this living water. Now, like I said, he's always looking for an opening to save people. If you look back, we don't have time to go through it right now, but if you have time today, go back a chapter to John 3. And in John 3 is when Jesus is sitting down with Nicodemus, you remember? Well, John 3 and John 4 go together hand in hand. Jesus sits with Nicodemus in John 3 and sits with the Samaritan woman in John 4. It, the reason they're side by side and the stories are together is because it shows the full spectrum of salvation. You think about Nicodemus. He was a rich ruler. Jesus sat with him in church. He was a man. He was a Jewish. Then you look at John chapter 4. You got the Samaritan woman. She was a Gentile. She was not liked by people. Unlike Nicodemus, she was poor. She was a woman. I mean, it shows both ends of the spectrum. And Jesus saves both ends and everything in between. It's beautiful if you read both of those this afternoon if you have time. It'll take you 10 or 15 minutes, maybe. But I just like the parallels that you have through them. Now, have you, has anyone in here ever been really, really thirsty? Like really dehydrated? Can you remember when you were the most thirsty in your life? Well, I can. I was in the desert right after 9-11. They snuck us over on a commercial airplane right after 9-11 because we couldn't go on an, an army airplane. They probably would have shot us down. So they snuck us on a commercial airplane. And funny side note, I've never been on an airplane before, okay? I was, I'm a born and bred South Carolina boy. I have, my feet have not left the ground in the United States, okay? So right after 9-11, I'm snuck on this airplane. We're taking off, and you know that you have turbulence, takeoff turbulence. Well, I'm in the center of the plane, center aisle, center seat, surrounded by 300 soldiers, and it starts shaking. And everybody's like, oh, man, this isn't good. We're not going to make it. So I'm freaking out. And then it levels out everybody. The whole plane erupts in laughter. Funny side note. But then we got to the desert. I was out working at my post one day. And I was doing my duty. And next thing I know, I woke up in the infirmary in the mash tent, in the medical tent there in the desert. Didn't know how I got there. I've got IVs in both arms, double bags of fluids pumping through me. I had gotten so thirsty and so dehydrated, I blacked out and didn't even know what happened. That's the most thirsty I've ever been in my life. It's never happened before, and it hasn't happened since. But that's what happens when you get extremely dehydrated. You can black out when you don't have enough water. There's so many people that are perishing today around us that are lacking the living water. I could have died that day, just like the people around us now can die if they don't have this living water. They need this living water before it's too late. When he gives you, Jesus gives you the living water, it will cleanse your heart and cleanse your mind. It makes you a new person. He says it will spring up into a fountain. People see it. People know it. It's like Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. Jesus is not just a carpenter. He's also a heart surgeon, if you didn't know that. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new mind. I will put a new heart in the place of your stony heart in your flesh. And I will put my, my, my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and know my judgments and do them. This living water will change you, but we have to be drinking from it every day. Look at verse 11. The woman says to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well? And drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock. So she only sees the temporal, like physical, immediate things, right? She sees he doesn't have a bucket. He doesn't have a scoop or a cup. She says, where are you going to get this from? But look at the first word. What's the first word she says? Sir. Okay? This word, sir, is very different than how she addressed him in verse 9. Verse 9, she says, how are you being a Jew? Now she says, sir. It's really important. This word, sir, in the Greek is from Kyrios. And Kyrios means Lord or master, right? You can see subconsciously the Holy Spirit's already changing this woman and she has no idea. She went from, who are you, a Jew? How are you going to get this water? Now it's sir. Immediate change, but she doesn't notice it yet, but we're going to see the Holy Spirit continue to work on her. But there's something about Jesus that is producing this change in her. His words, his spirit, his mannerisms, everything is working on her heart. I see the Holy Spirit working through this story. Does Jesus have that same power with us today? Is it a parallel for us? Yes, he will change you. You will see him start to change, and things in your life that you used to love will fall apart. They'll, they'll fall away. They'll burn, he'll burn off the dross. That's what he does. He purifies you with his water. 
Jesus says in John 16, 13, that his spirit will guide us into all truth. If we have that living water, it will guide us to what we need to know. And that's what Jesus is doing here at the well with this woman. He's using the Holy Spirit to guide her into the truth. Look at verse 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. I love that last part. Just read it again and say it in your head. A fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. How beautiful is that? This is the real fountain of life that he's talking about here. The true fountain of life. He's clarifying this living water is the only thing that will satisfy your soul's thirst. And I know because I've tasted the waters in the rest of the world. For those of you that know me and know a little bit of my testimony, I've done the things that people in the world dream to do. And they weren't enough. At the end of the day, I still sat at home and there was still something missing. And it was this. It was the Holy Spirit. It was a living water. It's important that he says, you will never thirst again. This word never is more powerful in the Greek. In the Greek, this word never means never ever again throughout the ages. It's so much more powerful than the English translation. It says never again throughout the ages will you thirst. Beautiful. Now, the English says never, and that's good, but I think it kind of waters it down some. But it was, it was meant that we would never, ever have to worry about anything again. And that's what happens when you have everlasting life. You don't have to worry anymore. Your salvation is sure when you have this fountain inside of you. Now, he's opening her heart and her mind even more to this gift. But look at verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go and call your husband and come here. Uh-oh. The dirt's coming out now. It's going to get it's gonna get crazy. He is telling her, go get your husband, because he knows. He knows her life story. This is how you know he still has his divinity, because he knows her whole life story, and he calls her on it. All right? Look at verse 17. The woman answered. This is her response to him calling her out. The woman answered and said, oh, sorry, I flipped the page. I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, or Lord, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now you see the Holy Spirit changing her. She's opened her eyes a little bit more, piece by piece, as much as she can handle it. And that's how God works with us. We can only take so much at one time. If God revealed everything to us at one time, it would be system overload. You wouldn't be able to bear even seeing your own sins if he showed them all to you at one time, much less to be able to stop them. That's how he works, though, as much as we can handle it. He, he works with us where we are. So don't, don't lose hope wherever you are today. If there's something in your life that you know he's working on you or calling you to give up, do it piece by piece. He's there. He's going to help you. Now, she knows something special about Jesus, like I said. And this is where I think she's really starting to see her Savior. And this is the miracle that he came to this well for. He wants us to see him clear today. He rejoiced when he saw this change starting to come over the Samaritan woman. And he rejoices when it comes over us. When he sees us making right decisions or giving up old habits or doing things, making choices for him, he rejoices. It, sets, it makes his heart ablaze with love. He tells her her life secrets and the conviction starts to set in. When conviction sets in, it's hard. It's hard when people tell you you're wrong or when the Holy Spirit tells you and points something out. It is for any of us. Our natural response is to shut down, and that's what she does here. Look in verse 20. She says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So she changes the subject real fast, right? She's, she takes it to trivial religious matters, and it, it's a common conversation. That's why she brought it up, because everyone knew this conversation at the time. Where the Samaritans were in Samaria, Sychar, you had Mount Gerizim. They set up a temple in Mount Gerizim and said, that's where the Spirit of the Lord dwells, not in Jerusalem. The reason they did this is because in Nehemiah's day, remember when Nehemiah rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem? They were mad because they were left out of it. So they said, no, we don't have to go to Jerusalem. God's presence is here at Mount Gerizim. So that's what she's bringing up. Do we go to Mount Gerizim or do we go to Jerusalem where y'all, the Jews, say God's spirit is? She's just trying to deflect. And that's what we do as humans. If you know Maslow's hierarchy, the theorist, he says that self-preservation is the first thing. And that's true. We all are con concerned with our life first and then everything else falls into place. But that's what you see here with her. She wants to deflect, change the subject real quick. And we do it. I'm guilty of it too. It's easy. That's your natural response. You don't want to own up to what you did wrong or what you're thinking wrong or anything. That's just, that's the way we're built. 
But my prayer for us today is that if the Holy Spirit's convicting us that we're doing something wrong, that we need to stop doing something, or maybe we need to start doing something, that we listen, that we let him guide us and let him lead us. He wants to give us all the water life freely. We know this. All we have to do is ask. We talked about it this morning in our Sabbath school class. We just have to ask. Think about Peter when he was drowning. The shortest prayer in the Bible. What did he say? Lord, save me. That's it. It's that easy. And Jesus was right there to pull him up out of the water. He'll do the same for you if you're drowning or if you're falling today. Just say, Lord, save me. And that's when the salvation process begins. Now, there's still going to be work to do afterwards. I'm not saying that. Sanctification is a lifelong process. You're not going to say, Lord, save me, and you're ready for translation. It doesn't work like that. You're still going to have a process to go through, but God's going to be there with you. Jesus will be right there with his arm around you through the whole thing. Look in verse 20 to 24. This is Jesus' response. 20 through, 21 through 24. He says, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. He stops that right there. He stops her deflection and cuts right back to the point. He says, You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Pause there for a second. Don't let that verse trip you up. He's not saying salvation is only for the Jews. We know that. He's just saying that we know that salvation is of the Jews because we know that the Messianic promise was to the Jews through from Abraham, I mean from Adam all the way through from the sacrificial system. That's what he's saying. He's not saying salvation is just for the Jews. It's for everybody. Verse 23, he says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So turn with me to John 10. And while you're turning to John 10, I want to point out he's just destroying the barriers. He's, he's saying it's about spirit and truth. It's about the heart worship. It's not about Jew or Gentile, young, old, any of that. He's destroying that. Look in John 10, verse 16. Everybody there? These are Jesus' words. He says, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. They will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Salvation is for every single person on this planet. He would have come for one single person but he's come for any single person. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are. He wants our heart worship, though. We need to be daily sacrificing, daily drinking at this well. That fountain of life is something you have to partake of every day, not every once in a while, not once a week for an hour, or every few weeks when there's a potluck, every day. You have to get up in the morning. You have to go to prayer meeting. You have to spend time in the Word, and it's time in deep prayer, drinking from this fountain. How else are you going to be able to give living water to somebody if you don't already have it? You can't. You can't tell people where the fountain of life is, the fountain of living water is, if you haven't been there yourself. That's what he wants from us. Now, look at the bottom of verse 23. What does he say? Seeking, right? The Father is seeking such to worship him. He's always seeking us. Think about the parable of the lost sheep. He left the 99 to go for that one lost sheep. This Samaritan woman is that one lost sheep. He's always seeking for us. The sheep didn't go looking for the shepherd. The shepherd came looking for the sheep. Amen. He came to this world to save us, to seek out us, every single one of us. Even if it was just one of us, he would have still come. God isn't some far off distant deity. He's not galaxies and galaxies away. He's a close personal God and savior. He wants that relationship. He wants to sit beside you at that well, just like he's doing with the Samaritan woman. When you sit beside Jesus and you spend that time with him, the Holy Spirit will change you, just like we see this woman changing. And we're going to see in the next couple of verses, she gets it. She gets who Jesus is. She gets that she has salvation. The same thing happens to us, but we have to spend that time with him. That's the only way you can do it. Look in verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. The spirit of prophecy tells us that she was already studying the Bible. The Samaritans also had the first five books of the Bible that Moses wrote, the Pentateuch. So she had already been studying it. She was already, you see in verse 25, she says, I know Messiah is coming. So she already knows what the scripture said. She hasn't fully got it that the Messiah is sitting right beside her yet. But she's about to. 
I've always believed since I was a kid that everybody has at least a little bit of the Holy Spirit, a little bit of goodness naturally in their hearts. Whether they choose to act on it or not, that's up to them. But I think God has always put at least a little bit of the Holy Spirit in everybody's heart. Some people choose to act on it. Some people won't push it down their whole lives. But I just, I don't know what it is since I've been, since I was a child, I've always believed that, that we've all got that little bit of goodness in us naturally. Maybe I'm just a hopeless optimist. I don't know. But turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And right here where she says this to him, that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ, this is the moment that he's been waiting for. This is what he came to Samaria for. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But before we read that, I want to point out a simple fact. This woman is the first person in the Bible, in the universe, that Jesus reveals completely and fully and openly that he's the Messiah too. If you didn't know that, that is an amazing fact. He picked the least likely candidate. He does the same thing today. Yeah. I'm up in front of you as a witness to it. There's no reason I should be up here right now. He picks the worst of the worst at the last second to use. Think about Mary, who's the first person he revealed himself to at the resurrection. Yeah. Mary Magdalene, not Peter, not John, Mary Magdalene. One of the worst of the worst at the time. They hated her. That's how he works. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Everybody there? Amen. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. Amen. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen the things which are not to bring the th to nothing the things which are. Sorry, my eyes blurred up a little bit. That's how he's doing this with a Samaritan woman. That's what he does for us today. He wants to use us no matter how far you think you've gone from Jesus or how bad you've gotten or how far in sin you've gotten. He can bring you back and he'll bring you back with a vengeance. He will use you to do great things that you'd never even imagined. That's how he's doing. That's what he's doing with the Samaritan woman right here. Look in verse 26. This is the moment. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now she knows. Now she knows who Jesus is. Now she knows she has salvation. And what does she do? Look in verse 28. The, moment, the woman left her water pot and went away into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. That's the work that we have to do. That's what we're called to do. God wants more of us to go out into the fields. He says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. She left her water pot there at the well, full of water. That's what she came for. She didn't care about it anymore. She had the living water. And what does she do? She has to go get someone else and share it with them. She has to bring someone else to Jesus. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to do today in the last days. We know that time is running short. Look at the world today. It's not getting any better. You see the six-year-old that shot his teacher last week? First grade, shot his teacher. In first grade, I was worried about crayons and kickball, you know, not shooting my teacher. I mean, it's just, it's worse and worse. Look at what happened in Memphis. I mean, it's just terrible. The, those are the people that are supposed to be protecting us. This, is, this world does not get any better. We know we have a short amount of time to lead these people to Jesus. That's what we have to do. That's my prayer for us today. But to do this, like I said, we have to be filling ourselves daily with this water. We can't share a gift with someone if we don't already possess it. That's the whole point of this story. The whole story is about salvation. That sweet Samaritan salvation is for all of us and for all the other people in the world that are perishing because they don't have living water. I want to finish with this story. And some of you might have heard of this. It's a true story. It's sad. But it happened a couple years ago. And the reason I use this story is to illustrate the point that there's so many people perishing around us because they don't have the living water. In August 2021, a young couple decided to go hiking one morning. They went to the Sierra Mountains close by, the mother, the father, their one-year-old daughter, and their family dog. They started hiking that morning. The temperature was around 75 degrees. It was beautiful. Blue skies, fluffy white clouds, no rain, gorgeous morning for a hike. So they go off into the Sierra Mountains, remote place. They start hiking, and after a few hours and a few miles away from their car, they ran out of water. So they tried to get back to the car. And the whole time they're sending out text messages, they're calling people, but they have no cell reception. They don't have a signal because they're so far out in the Sierra Mountains. 
Well, this whole time they're trying to make it back to the car, both the parents, the mother and the father, the one-year-old baby, and the dog all started to overheat because they're experiencing hyperthermia. They had absolutely no water nearby in sight, nothing on them, no rivers, creeks, no life-saving water at all. Two days later, the police found all four of this family a mile and a half from their car, and they didn't make it. Any one of you would have given this mother or father or that little one-year-old baby or even that little puppy some water if you could have. I know it. How much more do we have to give that water, that living water to people today? They're perishing around us. And not just perishing for now, they're perishing for eternity. You have to give that living water to people. That's our job. That's my prayer for us today. That's what we take from this story, the Samaritan woman story, throughout all the Bible. It's all about Jesus. It's all about taking people with us to heaven, to eternity. We have to do it any opportunity we get. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and for this story. Thank you for your living water. Help us to partake of it more every day and to share it with others so that they won't be lost, Lord. We know that time is short. The world's getting worse and worse around us. We have to be about your business. We have to take this water to many as fast as we can. We want to reach the greatest amount of people in the least amount of time, Lord. Just bless us as we go our separate ways. Let us spend a wonderful day with you this Sabbath and enjoy the sunshine and communion at the well with you today, please. In your name I pray. Amen.